unique New York. Unique New York. Here we are live with <laughs> David Corona in New York City and Billy <laughs> Eilish getting older. Welcome to the Demand Better Podcast. This is episode 13. I am your host, David Corona, and I am with, from Superior, Colorado, Dr. Bo Bobanko, the reigning champion. We just, today's topic, aging. How to, how to age better, how to age gracefully, how to have longevity. That's what we're talking about. And Dr. Bo and I are both quite happy, people. Yankees are winning. Bo, what's up? Not much, man. Just uh, This is the first time I've ever heard this Billie Eilish song. It's got it's uh, aging. Getting Older. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know that's what it's about. It's just called Getting Older. We didn't really analyze the in-depthness of the lyrics. Hopefully, Billie Eilish does not sue us. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a gorgeous sunny day here. We get over 300 sunny days here in Colorado. Another beauty here. It's raining um, here. Yeah, we had some rain, so that was good for us. We had a little bit of a dry spell. So yeah, you know, life continues. <laughs> Cheers. Spin, spin Drip, not a sponsor, but if you want to want Spin Drip does a, want a sponsor, we're here. Um, hey, guys, so we're going to talk about aging today. But we should start off the whole conversation. Um, with the definition of aging. Before before we go into that, though, we got two two announcements. Number one, oh, we we do we do. Go ahead, take those over. Yeah, I thought you were you know you had notes. Your notes are not. Your I have notes, notes but but, I, but we put that but last. You don't one look. In the you don't look at them. So okay, go ahead. <laughs> What's the point of having notes if you don't look at them? So the first announcement we want to do, we want to congratulate our friend for Raz Javed, who has been on a few times. He's going to be on a few more episodes in the near future. Uh, we want to wish him an Eid Mubarak also. Uh, yeah. He was uh, observing Ramadan all of this month, and that is coming to a close. So, A, that's one thing for him. B, Raj, for him, congratulations, brother. Woo! The congratulations is not for making it through Ramadan per se, no, but we can do that award. as well. He also won an award for the Society of Professional Journalists, and I assume we are allowed to say that. He shared that very exciting news with us. And then we also had Aaron Clark, who has won a few journalistic awards as well. So one day you and I can sit in a room with people with journalistic awards. I don't think you or I are going to win any journalistic awards. Anytime. We may. Anything's possible. Along the line of awards, though, the other announcement thing I want to get going, and this is something new Demandy. we're going to do. The Demandy Award. Uh, a little inspiration from The Office. Anyone a fan of that? The uh, the Michael Scott, I think he he called him the Scotties or the the Scotties. I forgot, the Scotties, yeah. So anyway, uh, we'll double check that. We want to fact check that. But the Demandy Award again. Our mission here is to demand better from health, fitness, wellness, all of these spaces. That's where we thrive. That's where we have spent the majority of our lives, careers, all that good stuff. So we want to highlight every episode. Uh, through social media, through folks hopefully being able to discover more of these awesome individuals, highlighting somebody who is moving the industry forward, who is demanding better, who is being the change they want to see in the world. So for our inaugural, always a fun word to say, uh, Demandy Award, our very first one is I want to nominate Rob Wolf. That's two Bs, one F. Some people would mix that up. Rob Wolf, Wolf Like the Animal. One of our uh, best friends here in Colorado, they're one 18 month old now, is named Wolf. Not yeah, after Rob Wolf per se. But uh, yeah, so Rob Wolf, some of you might be familiar with him, uh, best selling author, two different books. The first one was The Paleo Solution, and the second one was, I have it somewhere, uh, <laughs> the second one was Wired to Eat. So a lot of stuff around nutrition. Uh, he's been doing the podcast game. He was one of the first podcasts I ever got excited about listened to back in like 2010 when he was initially involved with CrossFit. And then he stepped away from that for various reasons that Corona would probably be excited about and agree uh, since he hates CrossFit in many, many ways. A little bit less maybe since him and I have talked more in depth. But Rob Wolf, I uh, want to shout him out. Uh, also, I don't have the LMNT stuff here, but he also started this company, LMNT, which is an electrolyte company with all the folks doing keto and low carb diets, uh, him being in that space, being a former biochemist, 
he understood and, and saw a lot of folks failing those diets because they were really neglectful of including sodium, potassium, and magnesium in their diet. So a lot there. I work with LMNT. If you want to try some, let me know. Comment. We'll send you some free LMNT samples. Um, otherwise, go to their website, drinklmnt.com. Shout those guys out. But Rob Wolf, well, the winner of our inaugural Demandy Award. Hey, Rob, thank you. Thank you for all your great work. Um, hey, Bo, you know, we if you know of somebody, if some of these, some of our listeners know of anybody who, who might be deserving of the Demandy, they should let us know because we really, really want to push forward. You know, this is a world of misinformation, a lot of stuff going on. We really want to give people, we want to be a resource for you and a destination, people, so that you can come here, take some information out, if it's a one page or whatever, take it out with you and use it to, to your betterment so that you can become more equipped with 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 a with a better arsenal, we'll say. Um, there you go. But with that being said, Rob Wolf, congratulations. Demandy, brother. The man fist. <laughs> It's up so, there somewhere. Nope. Up there somewhere. There. There. Okay. <laughs> so with that being said, guys, let's get on with this. Bo, oh, what's aging? So the definition I've been talking about for a long time in my social media and the way I work with clients is it's really an accumulation of damage that we do every single day. Uh, the analogy we always like to use here is also similar to the financials, right? If you debits, credits, people seem to understand that, how much money you have in your bank account. So uh, let's say you have a theoretical $100 in your bank account. Uh, let's make it really easy. And every day, let's say I'm stressed out. I have a flat tire. I had to go deal with that. Um, I do a workout. That's actually, even though we think of it as a good thing, it's initially actually lowering my, my kind of uh, body's ability to live because you're breaking down muscle. It's how you recover from that, and that's when you build up over the next few days. So through the day, let's say I have negative $20, right? Uh, so I'm down to $80. If I sleep well, if I meditate a little, if I do a little breathing practice, if I connect with my wife, with my good friend David on the phone, uh, you know, maybe I get back those 20 points, and I'm back at 100. Maybe I get 25 points, and I'm at 105, and now I'm making progress, and I'm building capacity so that down the line, if I – can't connect with my good friend, David, uh, and I'm sad and lonely and I lose some points. I have a little bit more buffer. So that's what we're kind of analogizing with aging. The other really interesting piece of aging for me, and I'm going to shout out David Sinclair, who wrote a book called Lifespan. Uh, subtitle is Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To, uh, which takes a really deep look into some of these things. It's actually a really good audio book for anyone who does audio books because in between chapters, they do a little breakdown with him and his co-author on updates on some of the research, updates on some of these concepts. They kind of reflect on when they wrote that chapter. So it was a really cool, interesting audiobook as well. But back to the concept of aging, he argues that it should be defined as a disease because aging ultimately is a disease, just like we ultimately, a lot of folks get hit with cancer, diabetes, whatever these common diseases are. Some of them are reversible. Some of them are preventable. Aging should be that. The only reason, and he goes really in-depth on this, that aging is not considered a disease by most medical professionals is because it happens to 100% of us. Uh, and anything that happens to more than 50% of the population does not fit under the category of disease. So really interesting semantics uh, if you're into that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, the, the definition is really important, I think, to start to understand and unpack is this common? Is this something, oh, all my other 40-year-old friends are dealing with knee pain and back pain, or everyone I know who had a child is, you know, dad bod. All these things are very common, uh, but that doesn't make them normal, and that doesn't mean we should accept it. So I want to turn the table back to you, David, since you're much older than me, and, and I do okay. want to set this conversation. Let's back up. Let's back okay. up a little bit. Okay, let's back up a little bit. So so I'm going to start off. I am, I am a Cuban-American. I am 53 years old. Um, I'm I'm always moving. I'm always you know working out, doing stuff of that nature. My background is I have been because of sports. I have always been active, always been active. I drink. I'll, I'll throw that out there. I eat bad food like everybody else. But when it's all said and done, 
um, I try to moderate all that stuff. So that's my background. Um, and I, the other thing I will say to all Latinos and Latinas out there, um, I don't eat like that. I don't eat our, our natural foods because I'd be about 500 pounds. I love <laughs> it so much, but I would be about 500 pounds. And I was brought up with a mom who cooked every meal as a kid. So that's my background. Bo, why don't you give us yours, bud? So yeah, I'm 38. Um, genetically, and we talked about this on the quick dive. You're a I, thousand. I made, huh? <laughs> what? Genetically, you're a thousand. Go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, we're gonna we're gonna dive into that a little bit later. Uh, I'll I'll say it while I remember now since you brought it up. There is a difference between chronological age. So I've been alive for 38 years plus. Um, but there's a difference between that, and you can measure with different metrics your biological age. So somebody who's 38 can have markers where they're 25 or they can have markers where they're 60 because they haven't taken care of that uh, machine so well. Just like, again, the car analogy we like to go to sometimes is you can really drive and beat the crap out of your car and not take care of it, similar to our bodies, uh, and not have the maintenance done and things like that. And your your tires wear down, your brake pads wear down, all these things. So your car's not going to last as long. So 38 years old right now. My father passed away from a heart attack at 41. Uh, and that was right when we moved and under very stressful time from Mother Russia, uh, the communist regime uh, in the late 80s. And we moved to New York City, Brooklyn, and there was a lot of stress. So he was drinking and smoking. And again, when we talk about epigenetics and genetics, that's where we talked about in the quick dive uh, is, you know, that most likely led to some heart issues on top of some predisposing most likely uh genetic factors uh but again when 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 we're talking about this is is his mother lived into her 90s uh in russia uh my grandparents of my my maternal grandparents of my mother both lived into their 90s or actually my grandmother i think made it to 89 or 90 uh so i have some decent longevity genetics somewhere in there and now it's about again, controlling and minimizing disease risk. But from my lifestyle perspective, again, similar to you, I'm a very active dude. Um, that early loss of my father with a preventable disease is what made me a very active human being. My mother also ingrained in me and whatever, uh, you know, she was pretty athletic her whole life. Um, so she ingrained in me uh, this love for moving, for fitness. So that's something for sure that's, that's a big part of it. Uh, again, yeah, I drink a little bit. I want, you know, of one or two, maybe some nights a week. And again, we can argue and, and look at some of the longevity understanding of that. If you look at the blue zones and, uh, uh, you know, this is something we didn't originally have planned, but the blue zones is an interesting, very informal observation of different cultures throughout the country, uh, sorry, world, different cities and uh, the, the researchers, and they weren't really researchers. They were more, uh, observationalists or, or authors, but they were trying to find which cities had the most centenarians and which cities had the most long-lived populations. So they identified a few cities and cultures that had that. And of all of the ones that they identified, almost every city that had the most centenarians had a, like about one glass of wine a night for most of them, except for one, which was Loma Linda, California, where there's a huge population of Seventh-day Adventists and their religion uh, oh, which right. gives them a lot of structure, does not allow them to drink. But again, you see some of the commonalities. At the end of the day, again, we did a whole deep dive on research, uh, a multi-part series with our friend Faraz, the award-winning Faraz Javet. Um, and so we talked about, again, it's it's observational. So we got to take all of those things with a grain of salt, not to the salt path just yet. Anyway. Yeah. But, and I'm going mean, yeah. mean to interrupt you there for a second because we're going to keep this moving. But I want to give a little bit more background. I can't really talk about my grandfathers. My grandfathers were, were um, they were killed. So um, that doesn't work. But my mother, my father's grandmother lived well into her 90s. My dad lived till 84. He died of Parkinson's and de uh, dementia. Um, and my mother, if anybody has seen me on social media, I'm with my mom. She's 92 and she kicks butt. Um, but with that being said, those are our backgrounds. We got the definition of aging. Let's start with number one, which I think everybody should know which is probably the most important of all these things that we talk about. It's never too late to start. Okay. Bo, take it over. Go ahead and I'll fill it in. Yeah. So uh, again, and, and I, I definitely want to hear about some of your clients. I know you've got a lot of great examples of this, but you know, this is something that we wanted to make number one of our top five because 
I think it's something we both hear a lot. Um, and it's a common mindset of I'm in my seventies. Like I've lost a lot of capacity. Uh, you know, what's the point of starting? And at the end of the day, again, it's like a bank account. Uh, the analogy is very apt in this situation of you need to build muscle. It's going to take us to our second point without, without giving the spoiler there. But it's again, that financial analogy. If you only have a hundred dollars in your bank account, it's not going to get you very far. Uh, if you can have $10,000 in your bank account, it's going to get you a lot further. It's going to give you a lot more room, uh, wiggle room. But again, there is this kind of penalty for every additional day we live. Again, it's accumulated damage, compounding interest, all these crazy terms. So uh, Corona's giving me the, the New York City vibes there with the, the police siren in the back. Thank you, Corona. <laughs> I, I miss I miss New York City and the white noise that is uh, police sirens, fire engines, all that stuff. So never too late to start is, again, very important for us to keep pushing out there. I think, uh, again, the people that we want to hear this might be your grandmother, might be your parents if you're out there might listening. Might be you. Might be you, for sure. Um, so 100%, it's never too late to start is a huge, huge thing that we really want to put in the front of this thing. Demand better from your body. Um, and it's never, never too late. Just like if you have a car, like at some point, yeah, you could say we got to junk this thing. <laughs> There's nothing left in it. Uh, but that literally is giving in to death. Uh, without getting too morbid, but that's what we're talking about here, aging. We're trying to avoid that. So no matter how beat up your car is, you could probably put in a new carburetor. You could do all these things. I'm not a car guy. I just know that term carburetor. I couldn't tell you what it does. But the point is, if you have a body, you're an athlete, and you've been letting it, and, and you've been neglecting it, uh, doesn't mean we can't have a session with David Corona on the Upper East Side of New York City tomorrow and start to move you in the right direction of building more muscle, getting you stronger, getting you more capable. So this never too late to start. I got a lot to say about, it, but I want to hear, I want to hear about some of your examples of, again, people in wheelchairs, walkers, all these things that again, we say, Hey, why don't we start doing some of these exercises, getting some of these things waking up? Yeah. I've been, I've been really blessed um, to be working with some amazing, amazing people. Um, I can start with my mother first, who actually walks pretty much a mile every day at 92 years of age um, and has a great gait. Um, and that is forced. And I, I want to, I really want to say something. As people get older, you know, you get into surviving and thriving mode. You know, a lot of the quality of life as you get older for a lot of people, does, it doesn't get better. It gets worse. And you want to have the ability. There's nothing worse than not having control over your own machine, which is your body. Um, but when you give it back to somebody, I'll give you an example. I have a 95 year old woman who I just got who was in a walker. And I looked at her walk, I looked, watched her walk and all these things. And then I started opening her up a little bit and started working with her. And now her, she's walking fine. She doesn't need a walker. But when you are baby, and especially with the older generations, Bo, when, when, we're, when we're dealing with older people, it's always, oh, no, 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 don't do that. Oh, no, 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 don't do, I'll get that for you. They need to get up. They need to be pushed. They need to work this machine. If you're not going to work your body, and just like my 95 year old who gets up, she doesn't have a walker. She gets up, she sits down, she has the walker, her assistant brings the walker. So her, when she gets tired, she sits, but she's not using it to push around. I know it sounds that I'm not compassionate, but the reality is if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. And it's vitally, vitally important that you push yourself. I'm not telling you that you push yourself like when you were 20, but you actually have to have those movements. Bo said it before, and I'll, he'll go into it later. I'm not going to get into it now. There's certain things you need as you get older. And I'm not going to get into it because that's our next point. But you need to move your body. And at any age, you can do anything. It's never too late to start. Take it, and, take and, it over. And, and the idiom or, or saying, cliche saying here is, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. But the next best time is today. This, that really applies here. Uh, again, no matter what your age is, uh, as you said, you, if you don't use it, you lose it, but you're losing it slowly and slowly. You can always build it back, back to up, some extent. Yes. You might have put yourself behind the eight ball, but that's not a reason to not do anything at all. And so we really have to have those conversations, that nuance. And again, the I think part of the thing is most people don't know where to start. Uh, most people don't know who episode to trust. Two. Yeah. <laughs> most people don't know who to trust. Um, I think episode one was personal trainers, uh, physical therapists. Therapist. Okay. 
but that's all right. But yeah, we have, we have this conversation. We'll have these conversations more often. If you guys need more resources. Again, that's what we're here for. We're trying to be that consumer's guide to where to start. So we, without going too far down that rabbit hole again, cause uh, we want to stay a little bit on task here is uh, let's, let's move into maybe the uh, number two. Yeah. We're going to do number two and number two is my favorite Dr. Bo saying muscle is the organ of longevity. So true. Flex up and explain, my friend. <laughs> so, yeah, we look at what factors in the research. And again, we're trying to be as science-based, evidence-based as possible. The term that gets thrown out here in the research, uh, which, again, we did a whole series on, on the research stuff. Go back, check out those episodes, is uh, what re- correlates to all-cause mortality meaning all anything that's going to cause you to die uh, short of accidents. Again, if you get hit by a car, that doesn't really mean, oh, well, that person was a vegan, uh, <laughs> you know, and it's going to affect those numbers. So when you look at that, but any, any cause of death, uh, whether it is, uh, again, some people die of aging. That is a thing we can, again, how we define that, all these things are, are going to be somewhat important uh, in these conversations. But in the grand scheme of things, again, uh, which factors are most related to that? Number one, grip strength, all right? Number two is leg strength, right? So number three here is the ability to get up and down off the floor. Uh, These are all very easy physical things to measure and have access to, again, we can do this virtually right now. Uh, They're very low cost things to measure. And we just know, and we can also build them up very easily. Again, no matter where you are today, uh, there's easy ways to do that. No matter how old you are, if you're 38, if you're 53, if you're 93, there's ways that we can build this up. If you're three years old, there's ways we can build this up. So coming back to that, the other one I wanted to add in is VO2 max. So it's a fancy term talking about how well you're able to bring oxygen into your body, how well you're able to deliver it to your cells, uh, which is what keeps our whole body moving, right? And then you're able to push out carbon dioxide, which is a waste product of that whole process and creating energy. So again, when I flex my muscles, there's those processes going on. I can't hold this forever, right? I'm just going to keep flexing. Sorry, if you're listening, you don't get the benefits of my bicep. But at the end of the day, that ability makes sense, right? As we get older, if we have trouble going down, up and down a flight of steps and we get short of breath from that, there's, there's, that's going to shorten our capacity, our ability to live life, our ability to play with our grandkids or whatever the purpose that you're finding is. Again, a lot of people retire and they go play on golf courses, right? They, they, that's their retirement life. So if that's what you want to do, that's great. We're not here to judge that, but is that moving you forward or just you using your, your built up again, people save for their retirement savings as well on the financial side. So when you're 65, you stop working uh, you know, this is kind of a common thing. Maybe you have a million dollars saved up and that million dollars is going to take you through the next, whatever, 20, 30 years, uh, just based on how you spend and things like that. So is there a way we can keep building money within those next 20, 30 years and maybe extend it? And, and this is a question I wanted to, to throw at you actually, that I put on my social media yesterday is David Corona. If you had the ability to live any amount of years, you just said, Hey, I want to live to be 300 years old. What number, whatever that number is, what number would you choose today? How I, can't long? Give, I can't give you that number. I can't give you that number. And the reason I can't give you that number in an accurate fashion and be like truthful with you is because I'm looking at what's happening to my mother as I'm watching her go through. As she at this point no longer has any friends of hers or any contemporaries with her. I would definitely not want to live to 150 if none of my contemporaries were around me or I could actually not get along. You know what I mean? If you don't have a base with you. Um but I would like to live as long as I can, as long as I'm fully functional. I mean, I, that's my whole thing is, 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 you know, we need to thrive in this country, in this country, we, we are very empathetic, sympathetic to seniors and us getting older. And because of that, this function happens nine times out of 10, Bo, you know, when somebody, you know, they're going down and say, Oh, my knee hurts. That, there's a dysfunction there that can be fixed. And and they just ignore it. and they go see a doctor. Doctor gives you a pill. The pain went away. Pain comes back. But you're literally not doing anything. And our medical care, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but our medical care doesn't really care to that. But in terms of an age, I think that would all depend. Um, I'd like to live as long as I can, as long as I can be functional and great. You know, you know, nowadays, that's not as easy as what was your number, Bo? 
like 2000? <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's exactly the conversation. That's the question. And I'm not going to dodge it like you did. Um, but, <laughs> but this comes back to the quality versus the quantity. So yeah. one of the other really big things I want to throw out there before I answer the question is the fact that five years from now and 20 years from now, yeah. we're going to be, you know, so much exponentially ahead of where we are today things are coming along that are going to really improve our quality of life. So to your point, if I could live with the exact same body I'm in today, uh, you know, yeah, I, I don't want to live 500 years. I'm, I'm just, a, I think it's an interesting thing because people become very curious. Uh, you know, there's just so much to learn about earth and, and see how things go and, and just humanity. Uh, I feel like, yeah, I, I said this when I was in physical therapy school, and realizing, you know, that I was really passionate about this whole concept of the human body is I'm never going to be bored. Like, and I don't think I would be bored for the next 500 yeah. years um, because things always change. There's always more to learn. There's always new research, uh, especially with the way things have gone in the, even the last 20 years. It's just such an explosion of information. And that's where we also see a lot of misinformation, which Correct. is why we're doing this here today. But quality versus quantity. Yeah, I would love to live to 500 a thousand, even if you put my head uh, like Futurama for anyone to watch that, you put my head in the, the little jar and, and maybe you can connect me to different uh, robots and, and things like that. Oh, so that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's enough. Listen, but yeah, not, not, ev not everyone wants that. So that's an, it's an interesting, fun conversation. Uh, number three, <laughs> number three, genetics versus epigenetics. So genetics, just to bring everyone back to how we define it, is what our DNA, what our what we get from our parents, our grandparents, our familial uh, kind of script, right? So it tells us, hey, and, and if you know your parents, you mentioned some uh, dementia, Alzheimer's in, in your family history. I have some heart disease in my family history, little bits of cancer there down the line. Um, those are things that we are more likely to have because it's somewhere in our genetics. Uh, we can do genetic testing, uh, you know, early 2000s, they were able to script the entire genome, the human genome. So we started to get an understanding of all these different things. And we're getting more and more advanced with understanding what is your tolerance to caffeine? Are you a fast metabolizer or slow metabolizer? That is determined by your genetics on top of epigenetics is the decisions we make every single day. So uh, again, you can look at twins. And, you know, one twin eats McDonald's and we're going to, you know, kind of talk about the, 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 the most extreme unhealthy versions, right? Each sure. McDonald's smokes cigarettes, doesn't work out. The other twin is, you know, plant-based and, and, and uh, works out, strength trains, all the things that we're going to kind of talk about uh, being a positive theoretical concept. And you see these two twins and they're very different looking, um, you know, and so the genetics, if they have the exact same relative genetics, if they're twins, uh, are again, what lay the groundwork, but then the epigenetics, the term becomes the genetics, uh, load the gun and the epigenetics pull the trigger. And we use that really to talk about disease. So again, if you have a likelihood of cancer or, or diabetes based on genetics, it's really your lifestyle factors, uh, and decisions. And the more we can be empowered and understand that we can start to go into our next point of prevent, preventing those Absolutely. things. But it's important to understand this. We now have pretty good technology to say, what are you actually predisposed to, um, as well as start to understand which things will help us avoid cancer or avoid diabetes. Yeah. Oh, no, it's a, that's a great, great, great point. And I, I don't think people realize that, you know, that you used to hear this a lot when we were younger with alcoholism. You know, if, you're, if you, your parent was an alcoholic, that it would be passed down to you. But, you know, they, these things are changeable. That nothing's written in stone, peeps. I mean, you can actually change your 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 future by changing your by changing your behavior. Listen, you know, not all of us make the best decisions all the time, uh, but but you have the ability to change your future. That will bring us right into prevention, which is our number four point um, here. Doctor Bo, take that away. Yeah, and and again, we are the accumulation of damage and or the accumulation of decisions we make every day. So if I decide from, from today on, I'm just going to sit in my house. I'm going to order DoorDash or Uber Eats. Um, I'm not going to exercise anymore. I've, had an, I've done enough exercising. I've done enough burpees in my life. Um, you know, it, whatever the thing is. And, you know, that's going to have effects on my health, obviously, right? It's going to have effects on my heart, on my physiology. 
uh, if we're not providing the right stimulus. Or if, again, back to our concept of I want to live to realistically, and, and this is a fun little fact, two, two fun facts that uh, we didn't really talk about earlier, or not fun necessarily because one of them is scary. Uh, but one fun fact is, and, and David Sinclair, who I mentioned before, he claimed that the first person who is going to live to 150 years old has already been born based on the theoretical advances we're going to see in technology. So pretty exciting and interesting stuff there. Just a claim. We don't know that for sure, but still interesting stuff. The other scary statistic uh, that I've thrown out on a lot of podcasts, and this one's a you know pretty again, just it's 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 mind boggling. So be ready for this, guys. Write it down if you need to. This might be the clip we're going to share uh, on on Instagram. <laughs> is the scary statistic is this is the first generation of children. Yes, I knew that was it. <laughs> this is the first generation of children that has a shorter life expectancy than the previous generation. And that's the first time in human history that that's happened. Again, in human history, we've done nothing but advance and improve our life expectancy, um, even though it kind of contradicts the fact that uh, we have somebody who might live to 150. But again, those might become the anomalies. That might be if you have the resources and not the, the overall big picture. But as an overall generation, we have more... Uh, uh, underage kids, whatever you want to call it, teenagers, uh, kids under 10 years old getting diagnosed with diseases that we normally don't oh, see yeah. again, like diabetes and things like that. So uh, we were going to talk about lifestyle factors and things like that, but, and this doesn't all, all necessarily go under prevention, but I did want to make sure we touched on these points. The part where we're going to bring it back to prevention after that scary statistic uh, and see what we can do. And again, hopefully if you're listening to this, we can start to improve and feel free to leave some comments or reach out to us to, to go deeper into this dive. We want this to be a conversation, not just between David, Corona, not the virus, and myself. Um, <laughs> I always got to put that in your name. Uh, but yeah, coming back to it, let's talk about something like arthritis. So it's something that we can prevent very easily. You said if you don't use it, you'll lose it. It's very easy to look at. Uh, again, something like osteoarthritis is a disease, it is a process of wear and tear, but it's also a process of inflammation. So everything you choose to eat, put in your mouth, expose yourself to stress as well. Uh, if you're not able to control those things and or you put too many stressors on yourself, that's where some things like osteoarthritis can develop. Uh, I just assessed a 41-year-old female who is a little overweight and less active than we would like, and she uh, did an x-ray for something different, but it did show she had bilateral hips. Both of her hips had moderate hip arthritis, which she's like, oh, like I have been feeling some pain there, but she didn't even think of it. But it's a process that if we can start to clean up some of those things, we know that it's probably going to improve the health of her joints. And so when we talk about if you don't use it, you'll lose it. Again, most of us do not go through a full range of motion of our hip joint, of our shoulder joints, of a lot of these things. We can adapt to a lot of this stuff, but the process is there. We also have the technology to just replace your hip. So if you have hip yeah. arthritis, great. You can get a hip replacement, but A, it's expensive. B, you never get that hip back. Um, it's not necessarily the same. The technology's coming along great, but uh, something it's not going to last forever either. So uh, I want to preserve my joints as long as I possibly can. I had a ACL reconstruction when I was 25 years old. Uh, and so I, 24 actually. Uh, and I want to, I have an 80% chance of developing knee arthritis because of that. And I said, I'm making sure I'm in the 20% that does not get arthritis because I don't want that. Uh, and this is again, what drives a lot of my research, sharing of information, all that stuff. So inflammation versus daily damage when it comes to arthritis, it's not just wear and tear. Uh, a lot going on there, but I didn't well, want to touch. Let me stop you right there for a minute. Cause you're talking to someone who's had three knee surgeries on the same knee. Uh, but that's not uh, what I want to get into is the arthritis aspect because arthritis is painful, but arthritis breeds on inact inactivity. And most people who do have arthritis and have that inflammation choose to not move. Right. Um, and that is, that is also an issue. I just wanted to drop that nugget in because people don't seem to realize that. Go ahead, bro. Yeah, there's a lot there. And again, to me, the infl inflammatory process is a huge, often 
overlooked component to arthritis. And again, you yeah. go to a physical therapist with arthritis, motion is lotion, get on the bike, get in the pool, keep it moving, baby. Um, and you know, there are ways we can build some of the cartilage back a little bit. Uh, there are supplements we can take to maintain the cartilage that we do have. We're talking about collagen. We're talking about glucosamine, chondroitin, MSM, some research to show there's some maybe benefits there, uh, but also reducing inflammation. Again, it's an inflammatory process to some extent as we go deeper into understanding this thing. So that could mean, again, less alcohol. It uh, doesn't mean completely cut out alcohol. Again, there's going to be balances to all this stuff, but stuff like alcohol, stuff like, again, uh, one of the worst things we could be putting into our bodies is trans fats that are then combined with carbs. So like, again, a fried food, <laughs> uh, which again, believe it or not, is uh, I'm sure most of us know is a very common staple of the 100%. standard American diet, AKA sad standard American diet. If you never heard that one. Um, and so fried foods are something that tend to cause inflammation in our bodies. People get all caught up and bent out of shape about gluten uh, and I mean that kind of all, every which way, kind of like politics, it becomes a very polarizing thing. There's yeah. something there, though. There's something there. A lot of folks, again, we see these nut allergies. People are very sensitive to nuts. Celiac disease, which is a, the fully diagnosed version of being sensitive to gluten uh, or allergic to gluten, uh, is something that is out there. So a lot going on. We're seeing a lot of these trends. We're seeing a lot of these disease processes. Again, we want to somewhat limit our conversation here, but again, it's important to start asking the questions, having these conversations, having a better understanding of what gluten can do to you, uh, but also understanding that arthritis has things, lifestyle factors, daily choices that we can be doing to improve and minimize and slow down that deterioration. Yeah, well, I think the, the key the key here is a is a good diet and and movement and having the right people watching you and doing stuff. When it comes down to this, when we're talking inflammation, it's pretty much our diet. The American diet's horrible, um, as, as, as most people, you know, you look at it from a whole. But with that being said, let's keep this moving, man. Number five. So biohacks, biohacks. and I put it in quotations uh, because we're all looking for that magic pill, right? If we could take the benefits of exercise and put it in a pill, that thing would sell out <laughs> instantly. It would be, you know, it could sell for whatever the number cost is. Uh, again, the benefits of exercise and sleep are scientifically just a profoundly solid. We know that if you sleep better, you're going to live longer. You're going to live better. If you exercise the right ways, you're going to live longer. You're going to live better, uh, which is what we're talking about here, right? So biohacks is, hey, like if you put butter in your coffee, maybe it'll kind of duplicate some of these effects, right? Um, most of that, again, comes into this salesy marketing, uh, sleazy car salesman. Uh, and Rob Wolf, uh, I'm going to give him credit. He was our demandy winner at the beginning of this episode. Feels like so long ago. Um, it does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, and I hope that wasn't an insult to me and, and just rambling here. Uh, yeah. that it feels like it's been a long time. But uh, <laughs> the he, he always uses that term, sleazy car salesman spiel. He kind of says it about himself, but there are a lot of those out there. And again, po poking fun at the fact that these kind of biohacks that get like, hey, you want to live a little bit longer. You want to do infrared sauna is going to start improving your health. Oh. Uh, you <laughs> And there's some science to back it up. But at the end of the day, it comes into hey, this kind of makes sense. It might improve your health. It might improve X, Y, Z. Uh, some of these deeper things that there is some smoke there might be helpful, but we just don't know. One of them is NAD+. Uh, so you can go and see some of these things uh, and, and say, NAD seems to be linked to one of the things that's naturally in our body that lo we lose a little bit as we age. So let's inject some NAD into our arm and maybe that's going to improve our ability to function and slow down the aging process. It's been shown that I've seen is the direct injection doesn't work so well. Uh, taking the precursors might help. But again, we don't know. And it, we might not know for 10, 20 years because this is new stuff. This is stuff we're trying to study. And again, research is hard. Uh, there's so many factors that go into it. So NMN, NR are two of the uh, precursors to NAD+. Plus. Again, a lot of terms and things, and we can certainly refer you out to other resources like David Sinclair, who has a 
phenomenal uh, podcast, and he's been on a bunch of podcasts, and his book are all great things. One thing here that him and Andrew Huberman, who I'm big fans of, uh, talk a lot about is, hey, like, don't just do what I'm doing. And also, I'm doing these things, and I'm trying these things because they're kind of low risk, possibly high reward, possibly, again, the other joke in, in the supplement spaces that I talk about is, at, you know, when you take something like too much vitamin C, the worst thing that happens is you pee out whatever you don't take. So we call it, we joke around, you, you have expensive urine. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> you didn't absorb it uh, into your body, but it's worth maybe putting it into your body and seeing if you can absorb it. So that's another big thing that I like to talk about is, you know, the old term, you are what you eat does not always apply. It's you are what you absorb. So just because you eat it, so similar to the butter in, in our coffee, which is a fun little physiological thing is our body can only absorb so much fat, which is why if you put a lot of fat in your coffee in this delivery system and you drink it, you might have to run to the bathroom very soon after because your body simply can't absorb it. So it has to get rid of it somehow without going too gory into the details. Um, there's, there's again, the fact that you're, if you're doing that, you're probably not absorbing the nutrients that we're trying to get and the benefits of what we're trying to get from that whole thing. So bigger conversations, interesting stuff. Biohacks to finish that up is anything you get to improve your health. And again, I'll call out a lot of these multi-level marketing schemes, uh, the pyramid schemes, the Ar Arbon, uh, what's herbal life, these kind of places that they make their money. There's not, it's not all bad. All right. And I'd love to get folks on here who have tried it, who have worked for those guys. Uh, but again, it's a, it's literally a pyramid scheme. I don't think anyone can ignore that fact or deny that fact. So again, if anyone's not familiar, I'm going to say, Hey, I already worked for these guys. And the only way I'm going to make money is if I sell Corona to get him to sign up and spend $10,000, whatever, every four months. And then he needs to go and sign up more people. And then everything trickles up to the people who got me to sign up and blah, blah, blah. So if you're not familiar with pyramid schemes, again, we're not here to completely bash them. But the reason I'm bringing that up in these biohacks is because people sell these detox teas. People sell all these kind of cliche terms that make some sense. But at the end of the day, we're here to call you know BS on a lot of that because, A, the scientist isn't there to support it. B, there's better ways to detox your body. Drink more water. Eat more vegetables. Like, <laughs> we're here to do the boring stuff. And unfortunately, it's boring, but it's easier to put, oh, this detox tea has helped me lose 10 pounds. Uh, but most likely, you're not going to get it back. And most likely, you're doing it in an unhealthy way that might damage your body more. Let me, let me, let me jump in here. I, I, I want to, I'm going to cut to the chase on this. We've been saying, I've been saying this for, for 13 episodes, I'm sure. Um, there's no easy way. What works for somebody else may not work for you. And when reality comes in, you need to take in what's best for you, not what's working for JLo. Because I always say, if you want to look like JLo, you need her parents, you need her gene pool, you need all that. You need to figure out what works for you. And don't take the easy out. Because as we age, it's what you do. You can't buy it. It's it's not buyable. I don't care how much money you got. You can't stop aging. You can get plastic surgery, but you can't stop aging. You need to do, you have to make steps, deliberate steps to slow this down and for you to have a nice, fruitful life in where you can do whatever you want all the time. Did so you disagree? I'm, yeah, no, I'm going to give my biohacks real quick. The biohacks I use based on what I understand to be in the current research and again is seems worth my time right and seems like a low enough uh risk in terms of again when we talk about this nad or or uh, again herbal life uh whatever detox tea type stuff so what do i do dr bo uh i go to the sauna as many times as i can uh per week we have one here uh, it's very easily accessible the sauna and Dr. Rhonda Patrick talks about this. Again, Andrew Huberman talks about this. Uh, there's a lot of great science and research. And this is a traditional kind of uh, wooden sauna, uh, not the necessarily infrared. Because, And again, there's theories on why that's better or worse. But at the end of the day, sauna is something that's been done for thousands and thousands of years. It's something I got introduced to a long time ago by my mother uh, in Brooklyn. It was a Russian bathhouses, which if you haven't been to the Russian Turkish bathhouse, 
David, in the East Village on East 10th there. No, Pretty I have sure not. they're still open, but he still forgot to turn his phone off. I turned it off, dude. It's, not, it's just I couldn't do anything about it. I'm sorry. Uh-huh. Did, how would you have turned it off and it's still gone? That's, that's impressive. I don't know. I don't know. It's impressive. Coming anyway, so sauna is something that, and there's protocols we could talk about um, and how much temperature and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, it's something I do as often as I can. I might actually go right after we finish talking into the sauna. You're going to sweat. You're going to duplicate some of the physiological benefits of exercise. You're releasing growth hormone. So again, you're benefiting your body in undoing some of the damage that we might be accumulating every single day. So sauna is number one for me, something that I do. I luckily have access to. Number two for me is exercise, right? So, and I'm trying to incorporate these different types of exercise. So real quick on the cardiovascular front, and I did a post about this and we talked about this and I'd love to dive deeper for you and for everyone is real quick, three times a week, you need to do one long, slow distance type of uh, heart capacity. I did a jog yesterday for 45 minutes. My average heart rate, I think was in the 160s. So that's what I'm talking about, what we traditionally think of as cardio. And if you can push yourself a little bit more and more there over time, that's how we build capacity. Number two in that three times a week cardio concept is max heart rate. You need to touch your max heart rate. Theoretically, it's 220 minus your age. So if you're 53 years old, all you got to do is get to 167, I believe, is, is your magic number, your theoretical max heart rate. Now, if you can get above that, and most people who are physically active, and I would bet Corona here is probably able to get his heart above that. Have you ever tested that or? I haven't tested, but I've had my heart rate above 170 for sure. Yeah. yeah. So again, if you're, if you want to build that capacity, that's a good thing to do, but you need to touch that max heart rate a few times uh, a month, let's say, but it, I like to think of it as once a week to make it really simple of, did you go really hard? And we're talking about a five minute workout or even like a 30 second effort where you can really push hard, hard, hard rest a pretty long time and do that maybe five times. And that should be enough to be a very effective dose of exercise. The third one to me is kind of this CrossFit mixed modal middle ground, the Goldilocks effect here, right? We have this long, slow duration. We have this short, high intensity piece and something in the middle where you may be moving in different types of exercises. Uh, maybe you do three or four different things for 20 minutes, somewhere in there, something in between. And it can change that. And you can modify that with someone like David or myself to- 100%. Uh, meet your demand. So that's number two is exercise for me in terms of my biohack, um, as, as I'm going to kind of facetiously call it. Uh, number three is, is the dietary component, right? So I'm just always interested in reducing the risks. One thing for me, and I'm going to throw out there, and again, we, we go deeper in this on other episodes and my content, go check out my channel, is I'm avoiding things like canola oil or yeah. palm oil. Things like that seem to have a very direct link to shortening your life, to shortening how well your body and your cells move. So minimizing inflammation, things that we think are pretty highly correlated to inflammation. Number four, and it's a little different to me than just exercise or cardiovascular exercise is, I want to expose myself to something heavy. And this heavy stimulus, as often as I can tolerate, and I'm probably, uh, I might do the sauna after I lift my 145 pound sandbag a few times. And I'm gonna throw that thing around. And again, that only takes a few minutes for me to do to have the stimulus to get my body to say, hey, I like lifting heavy things. It's gonna keep me moving in the right direction. Again, when you talk about your 90 something year old folks, their 145 pound sandbag might be a, a 45 pound sandbag, get them yeah. to that, or even a 4.5 pound sandbag just to give them that exposure. So one of these other biohacks that drives me crazy, or, or I want to call out BS on is uh, some of this Gwyneth Paltrow, like only lift three pounds, ladies, because we don't want to get bulky. Underloading but, doesn't work, people. Yeah. So we know that loading appropriately, loading properly is a phenomenal way to improve your hormones. We didn't even touch on the whole cascade of don't hormones. Don't go down that like hole. That. It's a huge, <laughs> a huge rabbit hole, but we didn't really touch on that. So uh, those are some of my, again, biohacks that I'm going to throw out there. Um, I have played with NAD. It's something I might do. We talk about supplements. Creatine seems to be one of those supplements that is incredibly well-researched, and it's something I've gone on and off of. And Me the too. really cool thing about creatine is it's been shown not just to give you muscle gains and in that kind of personal fitness, personal training community, 
but it's actually really interestingly been shown to increase your mental capacity and slow down and maybe even reverse deterioration of your mental strength. Because again, creatine just helps you function better. Uh, like a lot of these aspects of having more muscle, being a fitter person, your brain will actually improve as well. So something really interesting to think about. Bo, that's just amazing, amazing information. It's great information. And I hope all you people out there listening um, really took it in because it's these are simple things that you can do. It's very simple. These are certain things that, yeah, it sucks. Sometimes you have to go to gym and not, and and work out when you don't want to, but it's gonna it's gonna be worth it in the end, guys. I've never heard someone leave the gym and say, "I'll never do that again." That was the worst thing I ever did in my life. So, Bo, let's put a bow on it. Let's put a nah. bow on it for today. Nah. Let's put a bow on it. We're gonna do our top five. Number one, it's never too late to start. We can lower the damage. Please, don't ever think that you can't get going and find someone check one of our episodes we have it out there number two muscle is the organ of longevity you need to build muscle underloading is not going to get you there folks just not going to happen number three genetics versus epigenetics number four is prevention and number five is biohacks those are our top five for you to take away from this episode Bo, you have anything, any other advice to give them before we leave? No, I just think it's, it's again, this, this is one of the more interesting things. Again, a year from now, we might have all sorts of different information on each one of these points. Um, and we just want to hear from you guys. Uh, again, like I said, we want to make this a dialogue, a conversation, uh, starting to understand uh, markers. One thing we didn't talk about is biomarkers of aging. And again, uh, I did touch on the fact that you can test your chronological age versus your biological age. So there's some really interesting stuff there, but again, there's some BS there as well. So don't just go out and, and find the first thing that, uh, you know, oh, I'm going to get, I'm going to pay a hundred dollars and have somebody tell me how old I am um, and, and what things I should focus on. But having a complete picture of fitness, and this was my TED talk that I recently kind of put together is redefining fitness comes back to understanding what your body can do. Just like how far can my car go? Like, can my mechanic say, Hey, you can drive this from New York to LA. No problem. This is a good car. Keep putting oil in it. Keep putting gas in it. Um, or the same thing with our body. Like how many more years, quality years can we get out of our bodies comes back to understanding where are we today? What can we do to build that capacity? So again, you have somebody who's on a walker and they've been deteriorating. Let's get them moving better. Let's get them stronger. Let's get these muscles and capacity built. There's many simple tests we can do. Again, grip strength, leg strength, ability to bring oxygen in, push carbon dioxide out, VO2 max. A lot of these things, if you haven't had that conversation with someone like me, this is what I'm passionate about. If you guys can't tell, reach out to me. Let's have that conversation. Let's get you set up with some of these tests so we can say David Corona's VO2 max is in the 99th percentile of 53-year-olds, you know, because he's uh, way fitter than most 53-year-olds. And that's expected, but now we have numbers for that or – we can look at someone and say, hey, like you're below average on this. Let's start improving this. And here's a plan for how we're going to do that. That's what's missing. And again, people don't people are looking for that pill or they're looking for that surgery. They just see it as inevitable. And it's not inevitable. Changing our mindset about aging is what we're trying to get out here. Again, it's it's a disease and we can fight that disease. And uh, we just want to empower you guys. So that's my little ramble rant. I'm going to step off my little. Oh, soapbox. thank you. Thank you. Listen, guys. But first of all, thank you for joining us today. Um, please remember that we are here as a resource for you. We are. This is all about giving you guys as much information as we can possibly give you so that you can maneuver this crazy, crazy world of information. Please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and any other thing. Comment. And leave a rating, a review. Leave a rating, leave a review. We truly appreciate you. We look forward to seeing you. Have a great weekend. And don't forget to demand better. Woo! Let's do it.